the question was asked about problems using adaptive integration. We're using a distributed uh, model. The usual reason to use a distributed uh, simulation is that you're dealing with a model which is very large, uh, typically has many, many, many cells. It's a big network model. And uh, there is inherently a problem with adaptive integration in the context of network models because, as Robert mentioned before, almost invariably some cell somewhere is doing something that requires a tighter, you know, uh, shorter time steps and a change of order of integration. So that means you're going to be spending a lot of time um, on your on your in your model uh, changing uh, your integration method um, and 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 grinding very fine for way too long. So so typically fixed time step. Given all the errors that we already know about that permeate our models, that permeate the parameter values that we use when we make models, um, with a network model, um, it really doesn't pay off to use adaptive integration. Neuron does support what's known as a locally variable time step, um, but that also doesn't really pay off either, as it turns out. It was worth trying. But it doesn't pay off. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. All right. So so far today, we've talked mostly about neurons from the perspective of their membrane potential, or, and these are things that generate action potentials and synaptic events. But that's only a tiny portion of what's actually going on inside of the brain, right? So I'm actually a professor in the School of Public Health, um, you know, and I'm really sort of interested in in part with uh, neurological issues that are associated with aging and, and otherwise, right? These are going to become increasingly important as the population ages, but they're not just network phenomenon, right? Like there's, uh, you know, we can get some insight into how the system responds to medicine by looking at upregulated channel activity, but there's something on a different scale that's going to lead to axonal blebbing, or there was a question earlier about myelin. So the loss of myelin, uh, dendritic pruning, formation of amyloid tangles, uh, spreading to polarization and stroke, right? These things happen, these are chemical dynamics that are happening at different temporal and spatial scales than the action potentials. They're happening both inside and outside the cell. And so I just wanna sort of uh, very briefly uh, touch on all of the stuff that's happening, all, all of these things, and how we can model them with neuron. So fundamentally, when we talk about an action potential, right, a sodium current raises the membrane potential, potassium current lowers it. Well, what's a current? A current is the movement of a charge. So if I have a sodium current coming in, it's going to move sodium ions. Um, it's going to move Potassium, you know, potassium current is going to move potassium ions. Now, if I'm talking about big old Hodgkin Huxley cell, uh, you know, and a squid giant axon, the amount of changes is going to be negligible, right? And so Hodgkin Huxley didn't worry about, about all of that. Uh, but when we talk about smaller diameter cells, such as you'll find in, in mammals, then maybe this matters. Again, we have homeostatic mechanisms that are going to try and keep everything stable, but in disease and pathology, sometimes these things just don't work. And so, um, yeah, so we can actually use math and then identify the relationship between the sodium current and changes in the intracellular concentration. Um, yeah, and these, and, you know, a lot of these things are, so a typical sodium concentration of squid giant axon might be like 10 millimolars. Typical potassium is 54.5 millimolars. So these are reasonably large concentrations of things. But if I'm talking about calcium, on the other hand, instead of sodium, and I'm talking about calcium moving across the membrane potential or across the membrane or intracellular calcium dynamics, well, now I am on a whole different beast because a, you know, instead of a sodium concentration of 10 millimolar, uh, calcium concentration might typically be on the order of 100 nanomolar or many, many orders of magnitude smaller. And if I have a meaningful calcium current, 
I can start to see calcium changes uh, fairly quickly. And fundamentally, you know, this all comes down to the fact that a neuron is not a transistor. A neuron is a living cell. It's dealing with ion accumulation. It has state. And all of that ion accumulation, the changes in concentration, does have consequences. And the concentrations are changing both inside the cell and outside the cell with each action potential, right? There's a lot that's going on in and around a neuron. And this happens over and over again in the brain, right? It's not just a story about action potentials. Um, you know, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is about 50,000 neurons in a human, and a little tiny volume, maybe 0.3 cubic millimeters. Uh, and so, you know, the details vary by species. The hamsters incidentally have this weird double peak. Uh, but fundamentally, the firing rate uh, varies rhythmically across 24 hours. Those are protein oscillations, but they're driving changes in uh, firing rate. So membrane potential changes over long, long time scales. Um, these individual cells, by the way, are not so rhythmic. And so then again, gap junctions come in here to help keep the system as a whole uh, in sync. Um, we've got you know, other chemical situations. So there's evidence for hyperpolarization activated gradient persistent activity uh, that is likely due to intracellular calcium dynamics. So again, calcium is normally at a very, very low concentration. Why is calcium at a low concentration? Well, calcium is a major second messenger molecule. The problem with that is that that means it's used in a ton of pathways. So in particular, calcium is used in the apoptotic pathway. You don't want to trigger that if you don't have to. Um, so calcium is heavily regulated by the cell. Uh, the ER and the mitochondria will both try and sequester calcium. Um, and so there's, but they, you know, they also have the ability to release it and, and uh, drive up signaling. So there's, uh, I've got some papers looking at calcium wave propagation within individual cells. Um, and so these are changes in calcium, in cytosolic calcium concentrations that are driven by intracellular, truly intracellular dynamics. Um, but these have effects about the excitability of the cell, right? So now the intracellular dynamics, what's happening in the, in the ER and on the ER surface is now tied into whether or not the cell's going to fire. Um, Again, sort of on a different context, when we have ischemia, uh, we have oxygen deprivation outside of the brain. We have glucose is being interrupted. And we also start to see uh, potassium concentrations get dysregulated as well. And you can see a wave of spreading depolarization uh, that's associated with changes in potassium and sodium concentrations. As, um, and it propagates out. It's this sort of regenerative phenomenon, but it's happening now outside of the cells. And we can model this in neuron, of course, um, but how do, we, how do we model this mathematically? Well, fundamentally, we do what's known as a reaction diffusion system. And it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. A reaction diffusion system is a mathematical model where things react and diffuse, which is great because you know what? It turns out that that's what chemicals do. Chemicals like to move around and they sometimes bump into each other. And when they do, uh, reactions can occur. Uh, the simplest thing that, you, that people do to represent kinetics and when reactions occur is just to sort of think about, well, okay, if I have twice as many of one molecule, then it's twice as likely to bump into somebody else. And so then my reaction rate, this is known as mass action kinetics. The, if you have molecules that are reactions that are occurring according to mass action kinetics, then the rate is going to be proportional to the concentrations, right? Doubling the amount means I'm twice as likely to bump into each other. So I'm twice as likely to happen. Um, and then I can write differential equations for all of that. Um, and now it's, it's of course true that we all this is also given, uh, governed by conservation of mass. So I wouldn't actually need three differential equations here to represent 
this particular reaction, but it, it suffices to do so. In reality, of course, um, everything can go both ways. Um, so we'll never get, if I have calcium and chloride hanging out, I will never turn all of the calcium and chloride into calcium chloride because there's always a little bit of backwards reaction, right? Things bind and maybe they want to be bound together, but there's some chance that they're going to disassociate. If I wait long enough, I do expect the things are going to dissociate and this is important as well. Um, so then the our forward reactions are always physiologically coupled with a backwards reaction, but it has the same kinetics and you just sort of add that to your differential equation. Um, but in biology, we don't usually have the case. It's not like this plus that makes that because there's usually some enzyme hanging around, right? We have these proteins that interact and they bind with some enzyme and that helps them all form together. And so when we have an enzyme hanging around that's necessary and that enzyme can be the rate limiting if, uh, part of our reactions. And so it doesn't really look like a substrate goes to a product, it's well an enzyme binds to a substrate in some way and that has certain kinetics. And then there's this catalytic reaction where the enzyme and the substrate break apart and then you get the enzyme and the product. And so you get reactions that don't really be, that, you know, because of this enzyme, enzymatic limiting that's happening, you don't necessarily get the, um, you know, the, the linearity that you get from the mass action kinetics. And you can actually write down equations under certain mathematical conditions that are ignored all too often. Uh, but fundamentally, if we can assume that the substrate and the, the complex are in instantaneous equilibrium, that is that that first set of reactions on the left-hand side is very fast, or that the concentration of the complex doesn't change very quickly, then we can mathematically reduce uh, that, that set of reactions down into this Michaelis-Minton formula. And so this is the rate of change of an enzymatic reaction. Um, and there's a certain maximum rate and there's what's known as a Michaelis constant down at the bottom here. And so whenever the concentration of the substrate is equal to the Michaelis const constant, then we have basically S over S plus S, we're going to proceed at the half maximal rate. So why does this matter? Again, this is the enzyme and the role of the enzyme and limiting the effect of the enzyme. So if I had just mass action kinetics, if I had twice as much substrate, I get the reaction would happen twice as fast. In the enzyme, enzymatic case, it's going to level off over time, even if it starts out growing at the same rate. Fine. And in practice though, it's, it, life is even messier because I, you end up with these giant proteins and the proteins can have multiple binding sites. And maybe if I have one binding site that's phosphorylated, it makes another binding site easier to phosphorylate, or it makes it harder to phosphorylate. And so I can talk about cooperativity of binding. And so different things, um, once stuff starts to, um, you know, what, if I have a high cooperativity, so there's no positive cooperativity, in the, uh, um, then if I have a lot of the, if I have a little of the substrate, I really don't see much activity at all. But once I start increasing the concentration, I get this uh, sigmoid that ramps up very, very fast kind of thing. And less so at different concentration rates. And so this is what's known as Hill dynamics. They look a lot like Michaelis, uh, Michaelis-Minton dynamics. The only difference is that everything is raised to a power uh, instead. Um, there's a, there's a derivation of this formula that arises from mass action that assumes that molecules that I have in molecules that are binding simultaneously to N sites. That's obviously not a thing that can happen physically. Um, and the N is not necessarily predictive. And if you actually do this kind and you have some data with, uh, enzymes and cooperative binding, 
you'll often find that the best fit that you're going to get is not necessarily an integer. Um, but in any case, that can at least give you some intuition as to what, how, what this is representing. So different binding sites and different levels of um, more cooperativity. So that's all just sort of all the dynamics that can happen at a point, right? Your default assumption is sort of mass action, but then there might be enzymatic reactions. And then, well, maybe we need to have cooperativity involved and we raise it to a power. Um, but fundamentally, remember, of course, neurons have a uh, spatial extent as Cajal illustrated uh, so beautifully. And what that means is that not only does the membrane potential vary with space, uh, so do the ion and protein concentrations. Um, and so basic, and so at any individual point, you can't have a molecule that's sitting out in your dendrites not going to mess with a molecule that's in your axon. They're too far apart. But they can interact with each other eventually uh, by way of diffusion and transport, which is really just a fancy combination of diffusion and a bunch of reactions. And you can write down differential equations for all of these things. And this is using what's known as fixed law. And fundamentally, if you're familiar with this, you see something that looks very, very familiar. Uh, the derivative with respect to time is equal to some number times the second derivative with respect to position. Well, funny story, that's just the same thing as the cable equation. So chemicals diffuse in the same way that electrical charge spreads, at least in one dimension. And they do this all over the place. They do this in the cytosol, right? Most obviously I have stuff living in the cytosol. They're not gonna do it in the entire cross section. You have to consider that uh, because there's these organelles, right? There's the ER, there's the mitochondria, but the ER and the mitochondria, they're perfectly good places for things to diffuse as well. There's space, they're defining a region and stuff can move around in them. But so also uh, can stuff move around in the extracellular space, right? I've, I've mentioned that if I'm uh, firing action potentials, I'm taking sodium out of the extracellular space and putting it inside. Um, sodium and potassium and glucose and, and oxygen and how the cells interact with that in the outside space um, can affect each other in sort of non-synaptic ways. And so uh, these are all things that you might want to consider depending on your problem. By the way, fun facts, um, if you're doing a modeling thing, you know, you want to use sort of the minimum set of assumptions uh, that is appropriate. What's appropriate? Well, who, who's to say? Uh, but it's something to consider, right? You don't necessarily st jump in and start out with I want to simulate how this cell does. So therefore I'm going to build this giant model with extracellular space and mitochondria. And if you don't need it, don't use it. But if you do need to do it, Neuron is perfectly happy helping you do so. Um, and just to sort of throw this out there, diffusion is a, diffusion by itself is an extraordinarily slow thing because we can prove using math that diffusion, the time to diffuse a certain distance is proportional to the square of the distance. And so if I'm looking at something that's diffusing it along at a, what, a, what a plausible diffusion constant is, so like one square micron per millisecond, I want to diffuse down a hundred microns, which is you know on the order of the length of an apical dendrite, a pyramidal cell, then that's going to take five seconds. That's a while. And that's only 100 microns. You've got a neuron from the tip of your toe to the base of your spinal cord. That's like a meter. That's a lot more than 100 microns. So, um, you know, then that would go, that scale factor, again, square it, right? So diffusion alone is never going to be the defining feature. But the way that you can avoid this is to use regenerative signaling. The way that neurons survive and are able to send signals chemically is to sort of boost these signals uh, that spread by diffusion. If you're, if you're a bacteria, I'll just throw this out there. If you're a bacteria, you're small, generally, uh, and diffusion is fine for you, but it's not gonna work for large neurons. All right, so how do we do this in neuron? Fundamentally, 
Uh, we already said this from neuron import RxD gives us our access to all the reaction diffusion type of kinetics and type of specification. There is a number of tutorials available under the user documentation section on read the docs. Um, so you can go there. They're mostly Jupyter notebook type environments. Some of them are runnable, some of them aren't. You can go there and uh, work your way through this and try to see how all of this, um, find examples of how you, how you specify this. This has intracellular dynamics and extracellular dynamics. Um, so you can look at that as well. Um, fundamentally, the whole point of this though, the re you could, because neurons in Python and has in modal, which, and you could even write C in there, like you could do anything in any sort of simulation environment. You don't need to use any of this, but you should, because what this allows you to do is this gives you a standard so that other people know what you're talking about. And we can declare, for example, so here in two lines of code, I can say that I have a cytosolic region that lives on the soma dot whole tree. So that's everything that's attached to the soma. And it corresponds to what the traditional region I. So like NAI, CAI, KI. Um, and on this region, I have calcium and it has a name and a diffusion constant and a charge. Um, so I can do this very quickly. So I have calcium now that's going to diffuse. If it sees any calcium currents, because I've specified the neuron region, if it sees any calcium currents, it'll respond accordingly, uh, concentration wise. Um, and this allows us also to not just be limited to the cytosolic concentration and the area in the Frankenhauser Hodgkin space just outside of the cell, but we can instead we can instead uh, look at arbitrary domains like the ER, or the mitochondria. Um, and I'm not gonna go the, to this in detail, but I did give you sort of a rather extended set of slides. Fundamentally, uh, with the reaction diffusion module, we specify, we, we answer three questions, where the dynamics occur, who's involved, so what ions, what proteins, and what the reactions are. Is it a buffering reaction? Is it a degradation? Is it a phosphorylation? And so we build all of this, everything's independent of dimensionality, for example, is this a 1D simulation or a 3D simulation? Um, sometimes three-dimensional shape matters. I've already mentioned that we have a paper that came out earlier this year about how we simulate three dimensions um, in cells. And it also has some tips about visualizing three-dimensional neuron simulation. So if you want, you can check that out. Um, Fundamentally, as you're working your way through the tutorials, what you need to know is that rxd.region declares the uh, space of, you know, I'm declaring the cytosol, I'm declaring the ER, I'm declaring the mitochondria. And what does the geometry look like? Is it, you know, the entire region? Is it some shell? Is it some like fractional volume? Uh, usually the, if you think about the ER, the ER is this mesh of a thing. It's not like a compact, set yeah so shell is not really appropriate for that it's yeah it's some fraction of the cross-section cross-sectional area um some tips on all of that uh again i uh main thing is if you wanted to interact within modal with any sort of ion channel specifications you must declare the inner region it's typically going to be i um you can define, uh, so then as far as answering the who is involved, it's not actually that species. So species, not in the sense of a llama or an emu, but species in the sense of a chemical species. Um, so a protein or an ion or, or what have you. And so then when you declare the species, you say where it lives, uh, what kind of values it takes. To tie back into our previous slide set, um, we do have, uh, you can specify an ATOL scale. That is how, how, if you're doing variable step simulations, how do you, remember the voltage was scaled by a factor of 10 and some of those other things were scaled by a factor of 0.1. Well, how should calcium be scaled? Well, calcium's normally in micromolar, so it's normally very, very small, even though neuron uses millimolar for concentrations. So maybe I'll set an ATOL scale that's small. So ATOL scale of 10 to the negative six. Well, wait, let me, let me restate that. Calcium is usually on the order of nanomolar. A micromolar of calcium would be large. 
So I'll set an atoll scale of uh, let's say 10 to the negative six. When I'm declaring initializations, uh, initialization is extraordinarily important in trying to understand how a simulation proceeds. Um, it's an initial value problem if you've ever taken a differential equation class. Uh, you might want to specify that initial value as a function of the distance from a point or as a function of spatial position or just, you know, as a constant somewhere. Uh, likewise, you can declare, uh, in addition to species, you can declare parameters. You can use parameters if you have a species whose concentration doesn't change because you, you're not just, you're just not interested in it. It's not part of your dynamics. You can just hold something fixed. Just declare a parameter value on there. It's a convenient shorthand that you can use. Um, and I use this in one of the tutorials uh, that's, that's linked off of the read the doc site for specifying parameters. If you have a whole bunch of parameters, it just automatically constructs the various rxd.parameter uh, values. Again, if you're doing chemical stuff, this is one of those places where units really do matter because you know, here I have, a, um, I have a rate of change of concentration that's measured in nanomolars per hour. Perfectly reasonable rate of change for concentration, not gonna come up in the context of um, action potentials by themselves. We can look at reactions. Fundamentally, rxd.reaction is the main way for specifying a mass action reaction. You just sort of add up the reactants and then the product um, and a forward rate and a backward rate. Um, if you want to specify arbitrary kinetics like hell type dynamics or what have you, you can just say mass action equals false and then just specify the whole formula. So here's hill dynamics uh, with the exponent of two. Um, so this allows us to say how one molecule reacts to another. We can also use rate if we just want a sort of a thing where we don't have to worry about conservation mass. I have a thing that's degraded and then I lo no longer care about it. I can use a rate to declare a derivative term. Great. Or a multi-compartment reaction when the calcium on the ER is being sequestered in, or sorry, being, uh, when the calcium in the ER is being released due to an IP3 receptor into the cytosol. Um, there's some information here on manipulating nodes and grabbing concentrations, short version if I have a node. So a node is sort of the generalization of a segment, but for uh, reaction diffusion where maybe I have a different mesh than I might use for the electrophysiology because the reaction diffusion again happens in a different spatial and temporal scale. Um, I may care very much about three-dimensional simulations. Uh, so I'll have a node.concentration is the real value, is the current value, and node.ref concentration is the pointer and then I, that, that I send to like a vector record to see how the calcium concentration changes over time. Um, in here, uh, in the slide deck that you have, there are examples of calcium buffering. So this is a full model uh, that generates the picture that you see on the left if you were to plot it. Um, there's a link to uh, the uh, neuron Leloup gold beater, uh, Leloup Gons gold beater model from 99, uh, which is a circadian model. Um, so you can go and you can look at that. Uh, there's also some discussion about uh, calcium induced calcium release. Again, I mentioned the ER very carefully regulates calcium concentrations. If you're interested in that, um, so there's a paper that I have, uh, Sam Namoton and I uh, f first authors on that. And we looked at that. So once we sort of examined how an individual cell is responding, uh, we then turn back and looked at what's happening um, as how, what's the implication about in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a network model, if I have calcium, cytosolic calcium dynamics, what's the implication in a network model in terms of the ability to, of persistent activity, in terms of the ability to distinguish between patterns? Um, and so there's the citation for that if you're interested. And I mean, the short version is at least in our version, in our, in our hands, in our model, um, having the uh, ER calcium concentrations being able to play a role in the dynamics improve the firing rate discrimination. That is the ability to distinguish between pattern and not pattern. Um, there is additionally neuron supports extracellular 
uh, diffusion and uh, extracellular reactions using rxc.extracellular. It largely follows the same format as everything else. You specify reactions in exactly the same way. I will point out that the way that we capture the complexities of the extracellular space, when you probably don't really wanna think about it, um, we have a tortuosity, that is it's the technical term for the change in path length. So if I'm going from point A to point B, well, the shortest distance is a straight line, except in reality, inside of uh, a chunk of brain, it's not a straight line because it's gotta go around. It can't go the straight line path, it's gotta go around dendrites and um, axons and other and astrocytes and whatever else is in there. And so the tortuosity is a scale factor for accounting for that. Volume fraction is a, is a scale factor for accounting for the, um, the, well, how much of the extracellular space is in fact uh, uh, free. We can then do sort of simulations. And so this is, I have, uh, I don't even remember anymore, but a lot of cells, each white dot is a cell with uh, Hodgkin-Huxley-ish simulations involved, uh, kinetics involved. And um, so we can look at how a wave of elevated extracellular potassium might be self-reinforcing in that environment in the extracellular space. Um, and again, this is not sort of a mass averaging phenomenon. This is, hey, look, each one of those cells is at a discrete location in space. They have specific sodium concentration, specific uh, sodium gating variables and so forth. We can extend this, like I said, to three dimensions. It's honestly just one line of code. Um, RxD.set solve type switch it dimension three would switch all reaction diffusion simulations to 3D. You probably don't want to do that. You probably only want to do the area that's interesting to you, um, but you could. Um, if you're doing extracellular and 3D intracellular, those are threadable. So you can say, hey, look, use threads. It's a form of parallelization that uh, doesn't require sort of the complexity of understanding of MPI, which Neuron also supports. Um, so rxd.in thread of four says, hey, look, do all these calculations with four threads. And the punchline is it does a decent job um, with the scaling as well. Um, the reason you might want to do a 3D simulation study is because when, for example, a uh, dendrite meets the soma, now there's an abrupt change in shape, and that may have implications for how your dynamics spread. We can do those simulations uh, in Neuron. Here's a full example code that generates sort of this uh, map illustrating a propagating wave. Uh, here's another uh, example. Um, uh, tinyurl.com slash neuron wave curvature of, of seeing a snapshot of, again, same thing, a narrow source feeding a signal into uh, a wide source. And we see that there's a, uh, a curvature, natural curvature that arises of the wave front. Um, and that has implications for how fast a regenerative wave might propagate to have implications for whether or not it fails. Um, we can do this, we can look at, we can position our synapses in three-dimensional space and, and see how uh, a, if a synapse is releasing some sort of, some sort of metabotropic glutamate receptor that's releasing some, something into the, ex, into the cytosolic space, some, some metabotropic receptor is releasing something into the cytosolic space. Well, how does that spread? Um, we can combine sort of this mechanism with a mod file to be able to do all of that. If you're interested in uh, more of this, there are four, four methods papers that have come out on reaction diffusion simulations and neuron. You can check them out. Uh, they've come out over large range from 2013 to earlier this year. And again, of course, we have many uh, resources that you can check out. Um, and if you'd like, I have some suggested exercises uh, that you can also play with to try and get your, uh, your hands dirty and your sense of how to actually run these simulations, kinds of simulations with chemical dynamics. And so does anybody have any questions or comments on um, chemical simulation with Neuron? Again, I encourage you to check out on Read the Docs. We have uh, a large number of tutorials. 
uh, on exactly this. All right. So if not, can somebody paste the, uh, can somebody paste the link to uh, the GitHub repo in the, um, in the chat, please? So I got one more slide deck to pull up. Um, 